Christians are often looking for a silver bullet in the creation evolution debate. What's the most cutting edge fact for creation? Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. And today we're going to be talking about what's the, what's the most cutting edge fact or facts to prove biblical creation. Right. right? Now, um, many Christians, they, they want an answer to, to this question like, okay, what's the silver bullet? What's, what's the, the most cutting edge fact that's going to prove creation? You know, what's the, what's the atomic bomb of creationist <laughs> arguments? It's just going to de <laughs> devastate evolution and I'm going to be able to prove my worldview. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there isn't one. Right. <laughs> and and uh, given the nature of the origins debate, that's, that's just not how it works. Right. Now, there are some excellent evidences that support creation and we'll, we'll deal with some of them in a few minutes here. Uh, a creation in six real days and uh, that, that God created recently. And, and the thing is, the evolutionists can always get around them. There's always some explanation that you can come up with right. to get around those, even though we'll share some of the, the, the most cutting edge facts on today's show. And the reason you can always get around that is because you're talking about something that supposedly happened in the past. Right. So there's no observational yep. evidence. You can always come up with a just so story, so yes. to speak. And when I'm teaching, I often use a, a court case analogy. You right. know, people want to know, well, if, if creationists and evolutionists are observing the same things, how can we have these two different stories? And I say, well, it's like a court case, you know? Yeah. Somebody commits a crime, there's a body there, everybody's looking around, wow, what happened? Well, you collect some data. You get a DNA sample or a hair follicle or whatever you do, and you go interview some people. And it, when it goes to court, everybody's looking at the same facts. Right. N nobody has privy the information that the other side doesn't have, right? Everybody's looking at the same stuff. And so you watch one of these shows on TV and of course the prosecutor, he says, well, look, this is how it happened. And he explains the facts in a certain way. And the, the defense lawyer gets up and says, no, 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 look at the facts my way. And he reinterprets the, the information. He says, no, it happened this way. And so you've got two different stories, histories about the past explaining yeah. the facts. How can you have two different stories about the past based on the same facts? Well, yeah. Yeah. It's an adversarial system. They're biased. Yeah. They're fighting they're, against each other. They're paid by their clients to view the facts in a particular way. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's the problem is we're not talking about observational science. Yeah. And ultimately all facts are interpreted. I mean, we, we can go outside here and we can pick up a rock or what we think is a rock. And even, <laughs> even that, it might sound silly, but even that, there's still interpretation involved. You're holding something and it has to do with your senses. Are your senses working properly? And, yep. and it has to do with your memory, past history and so on. You know, these other things that people call rocks and this thing looks like those other things. So this must be a rock. You're yep. uh, ultimately, all facts are interpreted. Right. They have to be. Yeah. So, but nevertheless, moving past that real philosophical thing, it, it, let's consider some evidence that even atheists have said would convince them that creation is true. Uh, if, for example, let's just, just make something up. If human fossils were found with dinosaurs, right? right? Or, or let's, say, let's say if human fossils were found uh, um, inside, the, in, inside a T-Rex. So like it had eaten kind of, kind of like, a, like it had eaten. Right. So how would, if news of such a discovery broke, what would the response be? Would atheists just say, well, I, I, but that's it, there's a creator. No, of course they're not going to do that, right? They're yeah. going to come up with an explanation for these things. So they could say something like, oh, well, see, this is proof of time travel. So we're going to evolve, we're going to get smarter, we're going to invent time travel machines. Some of us went back in time, but it was like one of these sci-fi movies, and one of the T-Rexes, you know, stomped us down and ate us, and that got re recorded in the fossil record, and that's why we found it today. Yeah. Voila. So they can explain it away. Even something as, as, as like... What you, we would, would consider devastating yes, to their theory. Yes, they can still explain it away. Yep. Always a way to explain so, the facts. So the, there is no magic bullet here, right? There isn't, there, yeah. There's no way of Unfortunately, it. it would be easier if there was. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so why do apologetics at all? Right? People will ask that. It's, well, 
right? Yeah. But well, we, you know, we read verses that we're supposed to demolish these arguments that, that people have. Every pretense that sets itself up, you know, about the Word of God. But let's take a look at Hebrews 11.6. It says, And without faith it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So what's interesting is you've got this no God philosophy. Evolution is fact. Right. Sometimes, you know, how God uses that information, it causes people to doubt and then they start to wonder. And I mean, it's in God's hands. But that, that, yeah. that information, you know, many people will attest to, that's the, that was what God used to really start to, them to question that and to, and to start to believe, well, maybe there is a God and they came to saving faith. Right. And the same, we find the same thing. Uh, in, in Luke 16, for example, the rich man says, well, if this great miracle, if somebody comes back from the dead, then people will believe. Right. And the response is, no, they won't. Right. There are no magic bullets. In Job 40, in response to Job's questioning of God's wisdom, God sets out his credentials and challenges Job to answer a 77-question creation science exam. He says to Job, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. The exam covers the breadth of God's creative power, mentioning the wonders of many animals that we are familiar with, such as the lion, raven, deer, ox and ostrich. Finally, there is Leviathan, a terrifying aquatic creature with an impenetrable hide impervious to harpoons, fearsome teeth and a back covered in rows of shields. It even has firebrands streaming from its mouth and smoke from its nostrils. Though this may sound mythological to us, Job recognized it as a real creature. Indeed, one candidate from the fossil record is Sarcosuchus, a 12-meter or 40-foot monster with an unusual bulbous cavity at the end of its snout that could conceivably have been used for mixing fire-generating chemicals. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, if you just tuned in, we're talking about top evidences for creation today on Creation Magazine Live. Great. Now let's start with the growing number of fresh dinosaur bones. Yes, you heard right. Yeah. We're not talking about dinosaur fossils, we're talking about dinosaur bones. There's been a number of discoveries made uh, over the years. We've actually done an entire show on this. Uh, if you missed it, like, like any episode, you can go, go online. Uh, they're there on the Media Center in, on uh, creation.com. Go to creation.com slash CML. It's Creation Magazine Live 3-02. It's uh, episode two of season three. Yeah. Now, we'll, we'll summarize it here, but for more details, have a look at that episode there. The first major discovery was back in the 90s, the early 90s. Right. And it was red blood cells in a T-Rex bone. And that was That was groundbreaking. huge. That was groundbreaking. huge. Yeah. And then in 2005, there was soft tissue in a T-Rex bone, apparently 70 million years old. That, that's their dating, not ours. Because right, the first one, that was highly it's, disputed. Oh, it's a red blood cell. It's not really a blood yeah, vessel. Yeah, well, they tested it chemically, and it all checks out, and, yeah. and so on. 2008 had soft tissue in a hadrosaur bone, apparently 80 million years old. 2012, dino DNA, and we did a, a show on that a few weeks ago. And uh, in 2013, carbon-dated dinosaur bones and also soft tissue in a triceratops horn. So right. lots of stuff happening there, that the history of soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Exactly. Here's an actual list of what has been found in dinosaur bones so far. And just look at the screen. Um, we've got blood cells. Found them. Blood vessels, where their contents could actually be squeezed out. Uh, hemoglobin. Actin, which is a protein. Uh, tubulin, that's a protein. Uh, collagen, another protein. Histones. Uh, this is a specific protein for DNA. It packages and orders the DNA. So this is pretty delicate stuff here we're talking about. Yeah. And actual dinosaur DNA has been found. These are all things that have been found inside unfossilized dinosaur bones. Yeah, that's, that, that's a cutting-edge fact. Yeah. That, that's, that's huge. I mean, it goes completely against evolution that, dino, that, that these organic materials should have been preserved in any way uh, for, for millions and millions of years. Exactly. In addition... Uh, the, to all this, dinosaur bones have been carbon dated. Mm -hmm. Yes, carbon dated. Uh, now, carbon dating has nothing to do with millions of years, by the way. Go to uh, check out our Creation Answers book, and actually, you can read that book online for free at creation.com. Right. It should only um, date something up to a maximum of, let's say, 90, 100,000 years. Yeah, beyond that, there shouldn't be any carbon 14 left. Right. Uh, but the, the bones have actually been uh, carbon dated, they, they got dates. There's plenty of carbon-14 still there, dates ranging between 22,000 and 39,000 years old. But they're now, supposed to be millions of years old. supposed to be dinosaur. millions of years old, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The carbon dating shouldn't even work, right. but it does. They, they dated these bones. Now, 
there's a bit of drama around what happened with this, <laughs> with this discovery. The scientists involved were supposed to present their paper at a, uh, a joint conference of the American Geophysical Union and the Asia Oceanographic, uh, Ocean, Oceana uh, Geosciences Society. Mm -hmm. And uh, when two of the, the, two of the conference chairmen pulled the paper. Right, the guy did his presentation, right? The, the paper was posted and it got pulled. And, and, and they pulled it from the, from the website. Yeah. Uh, one of the reports on the conference said this afterwards. The abstract was removed from the conference website by two chairmen because they could not accept the findings. Unwilling to challenge the data openly, they erased the report from public view without a word to the authors. <laughs> Now, if you want more details on this, go to creation.com slash c14-dinos, and uh, you're going to see at, at the end of the article, it has this list, and you can see this on your screen, yeah. with links to articles of previous discoveries in unfossilized, uh, of unfossilized organic material. So, uh, obviously, this stuff can't last for 65 million years. What they're yes. finding here, yeah. this is a huge problem. Uh, it, it, it supports the fact that dinosaurs lived very recently. This is a huge problem for evolution. Right, yeah. There's a principle called Occam's razor, William of Occam and so on. And, and, and basically what it is, is the simplest explanation is the best, or, or, or more fanciful definition. Among competing hypotheses, the hypothesis with the fewest assumptions should be selected. Right. Well, What's the simplest explanation here? That it was right. recent, it, <laughs> not millions it, of years old. Dinosaurs didn't die millions of years ago. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Now, people have actually attacked us and said, well, you guys are making this stuff up. But we're actually taking this from peer-reviewed uh, evolutionary science journals. Right. right? And we're yeah. not making this stuff up. <laughs> so. I mean, and we, we could answer them along the lines of, you know, look, if you don't like this, maybe your worldview has some inaccuracies. Maybe and it needs some adjusting. Maybe it needs some adjusting. That's right. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about the cutting edge facts for creation. Right. Uh, evidences that strongly favor creation and are very difficult to explain for evolutionists. Now let's move on. Flood geology. This is another area that is just, it, to many of us, a hands down winner for, uh, for right. creation. But again, this is a matter of interpretation. Right. You're going to find interpretations out there that, oh, no, no, no flood geology, millions of years, and so on. But again, very, very difficult. Grand Canyon, for example. Uh, here are the different inter interpretations. Either a wee little bit of water, the river down at the bottom there, um, carved the canyon over eons of time, or a whole lot of water did it in a short period of time. Right. Same data different interpretations. It's the courtroom analogy all over again. Right. It wasn't that the flood caused the, the flood laid the, the layers down, but then, you know, as the, as the continents came up, water rushed off and it just carved a, a huge, huge valley. That's right. the way we yeah. explain that. Um, you know, we've got uh, modern canyons that have formed very quickly, yes. right? Here's yeah. a canyon that's uh, 1,500 feet long, 120 feet deep. This is the uh, Burlingame Canyon near uh, Walla Walla in uh, Washington. Sounds like an Aussie name actually. It, it does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here's a before and after picture. Uh, this is amazing, just the, the short period of time that this happened. So um, anyway, for more details on this, uh, go to creation.com slash walla underscore canyon and you'll find a uh, neat article on that. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's, that, that's just a, an interesting analogy. <clears throat> this, this, this canyon, that's still pretty sizable here, mm -hmm. this canyon, uh, formed by a lot of water over a very short period of time. Right. And a good analogy for Grand Canyon, the, the runoff from the flood. Uh, there's a great deal of support being, uh, for, for the Grand Canyon being eroded by a lot of water, not the, not the other scenario. A receding flood scenario for the formation, the cutting of the canyon, is a great explanation. You can see that at creation.com slash GC origin. Uh, get some more details there on the receding floodwaters carving the canyon toward the end of the flood. Right. One of the best evidences that, that support the Bible is the concept of fossils being found globally, everywhere, yes. all over the planet. What would you expect to find if there had been a great deluge like described in Genesis 6 to 9? Billions of, of dead things buried in sedimentary layers, which is exactly what we find. And, and some of these 
these fossils are beautifully preserved. You know that they were buried rapidly. If you got a tree going through several layers, standing upright, well, all yeah, those layers must yeah. have got laid down at the same time, or you wouldn't have made a fossil tree. Fossils themselves are great proof that the, of what the Bible says, there was a great flood. Yeah. If there was a global flood, as the Bible records, the fossil record is exactly what we would expect to find. Right. It's exactly what we'd expect to find. However, if sediments were deposited slowly, the evolutionary story that we hear so much about, you wouldn't expect to find anything <laughs> biological right. in the rocks. It would, all, it would have rotted. Right, because today be you're driving along the road, you see a dead deer. You know that dead deer is not going to turn into a fossil. Yeah. Because it's yeah. not going to get covered rapidly with, with fossils. Now, of course... Uh, um, evolutionists have now switched, right? They've said, well, there's been so much ev evidence for rapid burial. They've they recognize to, that. Yeah, yes. they've, they've switched yeah. to what they call neocatastrophism. So they say, okay, well, you got a dead tree there. Obviously, all that layers got laid down quickly. You right. say, great, so you don't believe in millions of years? Oh, yes, we do. You say, well, where'd your millions of years fit? Well, it's neocatastrophism, right? We, first, you deposit this bunch really rapidly, and you got this bunch really rapidly, and this bunch. You, you ask them, well, where's your millions of years then? They say, well, actually, it's, it's in between the layers where there's no evidence. See, what they would say so was, look, we got a whole bunch of uh, stuff deposited, and then there was millions of years of erosion. And then another big dump got put down, and then millions of years of erosion. So now they're saying that the evidence is in between the layers where there's no evidence. The absence of evidence becomes evidence of millions of years yeah, instead of yeah. the other way around. <laughs> and, and the problem with it is that if that was true, you would expect, okay, well, erosion doesn't take place uniformly. It's going to be all jagged and stuff, and so you, right. you should see that, and then another layer, and that's all jagged. That's not what we see at Grand Canyon. Looks like yeah. a series of pancakes. Looks like it's cut by a razor hundreds of kilometers. Yeah. Obviously, it yeah. got laid down quickly. Great, great support. For yeah. It. And the order in the fossil record is something else that we can point to. Right. Um, if there was a flood, we would expect a certain order. It's not going to be all random. Evolutionists often... Uh, criticize us that because there is an order in the fossil record yeah, uh, and we would expect an order a, a global flood is going to bury things at the bottom of the ocean first and that's what we find uh, most that's of what we find. is ocean marine creatures yeah, marine at creatures. the very bottom right yeah. and then it goes up from there then you have fish and amphibians and reptiles and mammals at the top and that's generally what we find however a flood also explains things out of place right and evolutionists would say well, th well there aren't any i mean they need a very ordered sequence a flood explains a general order and things out of order. It's a good explanation, a cutting-edge fact. Did you hear about the whale that exploded? In 2001, a dead whale found floating off the coast of South Australia did just that. Authorities became worried because people ferried out to the whale in charter boats were standing on the floating carcass while white pointer sharks tore at the whale's flesh. They called in the police bomb squad to sink it. But even after detonating three explosives in the whale's belly, it still refused to sink. Many people think that when a fish or whale dies, it sinks to the ocean's bottom, where sediment slowly covers it and it becomes a fossil. But this doesn't make sense. Dead fish and whales float. If pieces do eventually make it to the ocean floor, crabs and bacteria consume them. But we find lots of fish and even whale fossils showing that they must have been buried quickly, like in the global flood of Noah that the Bible records. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, today our topic is cutting-edge facts, or evidences for creation, and another massive problem for evolution is mutations in humans. Now, mutations are often seen as the savior for evolution. They're yes. supposed to mutate us and evolve us. If you're or, a fan or of the X-Men uh, yeah. movies and, and comic books, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Mutations are good. The, no. the problem is the mutation isn't good. No. And each new generation of humans uh, obviously begins with more mutations than the last generation, right? And this is a, a massive problem for evolution. You might think it's good, but it's not. And, and it actually powerfully supports creation. Now, in Dr. John Sanford's book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. He actually summarizes what leading evolutionary human population geneticists find in their, in their research. And, and we re highly recommend this book. It, yeah. it's, it's actually yeah. really not a fun book if you're not a Christian because what it shows is that within another you know, 200 years, max, our genetics are going to crash to the point where it's just not pretty. But anyway, uh, we know the story's a little different. But... Um, if you read the Bible. But anyway, we've talked about this before. You can go to creation.com uh, creation slash CML2-03. That's Creation Magazine Live Season 2 
uh, episode three, some great information in that one about what we're talking about. We're just right. summarizing right now. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and we'll summarize right here. Here are some <clears throat> of the key points. As far back as the 1950s, leading human population geneticists were becoming concerned of mutation rates in right. humans of between 0.1 and 0.3 mutations per person per generation. Right. So every generation, every new generation would have between 0.1 and 0.3. They were concerned. Why were they concerned? Because if the mutation rates were that high, the human race would be doomed to extinction. It's That's just right. a matter of time. And we shouldn't now, be here if it had been occurring over millions of years. If it's millions of years, yeah, we shouldn't. That was their concern. In the 50s, 0.1 to 0.3. What are the actual mu uh, mutation rates? I mean, genetics has moved on tremendously since that time. Very fast-moving field of science. Yeah. What are the mutation rates? The latest data suggests not 0.1 or 0.3 or 1 or 2, but 60. 60 mutations per person per generation. What would that look like? If we start with two people like this, so if they have 60 mutations, all people in the next generation would have about 60 mutations, and all people in the following generation would have... 120 mutations. Right. And all people in the next generation would have, yeah, you guessed it, 180 <sighs> mutations, right? Now, th that, that is absolutely devastating to evolutionary theories of right. how long humans have been around. We, 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 we can't have been around that long. If right. we graph it out, and you, you see this graph here, and we, we talked about this on, on the other program as well, you can download the software that actually produces these. It's, uh, you go to mendelsaccountant.info and you can download this. And you see that the, um, in the center of the screen there, you see the values that have been put in the software, and you see those red pluses that form the sloping line. That's fitness. Starts at 100% fitness, and at the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the graph is 0% fitness. When that red line reaches zero, we, we don't have enough fitness to survive and right. to live and, to, and to carry on. We're extinct. It's an extinction event. You know, a, a way to get people to understand this is I say, look, if you took the Encyclopedia Britannica as an analogy for the human genome, you, you put it on a computer and you introduced random mutations, random mm. spelling mistakes, and you just let that thing fly, eventually you're, gonna, you're not going to have, you know, 30 new volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica. You're going to have an a mindless piece of goo. It, yes. It's not going to say anything. It's just going to be random letters and it's not going to have any more information. That's exactly what's happening to the human genome. Right. And, and even if muta evolutionists want to say, well, yeah, but beneficial mutations, even by their own standards, there isn't enough beneficial mutations to overcome all the de deleterious ones, right? Right. That are deleting yeah. information. So, um, of course, the most natural in interpretation is humans have not been evolving for millions of years. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We'd, <laughs> we'd be, be extinct. We'd be extinct already. And, and this is a, yeah. a huge problem, and, and currently, um, they don't have an answer. Yeah, they don't have an answer. They don't it's, have an it's, explanation for it's this. It's a cutting edge. It's one of those, it's one of those, it's similar to a magic bullet, because they don't, they don't have an answer yet. Yeah. Uh, but they'll, they'll come up with something. Okay, yeah, Eventually. Sure. Yeah. Um, but is it a, okay, let's, let's turn the card around, and, and is it a problem from our perspective? Absolutely not. Well, it fits exactly what the scripture says. That in the beginning, we, we started as perfect. And it wasn't that long ago. Right. Yeah. And then we've, we've, we've fallen. And, and, and see, the fall wasn't just a, a, a spiritual thing. It's not just a philosophical thing. Yeah, Romans 8, it affects the whole the creation. The entire creation groans yes. and travails and is wearing out like a garment. Well, that's exactly what's happening to our genetics as well. Yeah. It, so it fits perfectly with what the scripture says. So, uh, yeah, not a problem for us to, to explain it all. Huge problem huge cutting-edge problem for evolution. That's right. And we'll be back. Richard Van Grad and Calvin Smith also host a fast-paced and informal internet-based video program called Genesis Unleashed. These faith-building teaching videos feature responses to news articles, summaries of articles on creation.com, interviews, and answers to some of the most asked questions about the creation evolution issue and the most attacked book of the Bible, Genesis. Visit creation.com's media center to view or subscribe to the latest video content. Welcome back to Creation Magazine Live. Here we're in the feedback segment. And this is kind of a different type of feedback because, you know, people will often write in and, and, and kind of give us their testimony about, uh, you know, what they experienced and, and their journey. And, uh, of course, this feedback, this person, this actually became an article on the website. Yeah, and it was yeah. entitled, Amazed to Discover Evidence for Creation. Yeah, this is uh, David Spannenberg, and, um, and, and he, he writes about his experiences, and we thought this was, uh, that, that 
you could probably relate to this that you or you or, or, or people you may know can maybe relate to uh, David's story here. Uh, he grew up as an evolutionist. He was taught that in school, yada, yada, yada. We all know the story. We have all been taught that. And, uh, and he says uh, further in his article, he says, it wasn't until I was about 28 years old that I first heard any mention that there was evidence to back up creation and a young earth. It hadn't occurred to me that there was a problem with believing in millions of years of evolution. But then I heard a testimony of a man from my church I was involved in. He was brought up in the church, went to Newcastle University, this is in Australia, right. to do a science degree, lost his faith in God and the Bible as a result of evolutionary teaching. Right. That's popular nowadays. Yep. And majored in evolutionary studies himself. But then someone challenged him with the evidence of biblical creation to the point where he became a Christian. <laughs> so just remarkable. Now he incorporates creation science into his class instruction as a science teacher in a Christian school in Australia. So David is referencing this, uh, this guy here. That's right. And that's such a common, like, that, that, that's, that's, right. Like, we both. hear that all over the place. Right. We, we both go out and speak, and there's other speakers around the world, uh, seven offices we have right now around the world, and speakers go out and speak, and we hear this all the time. Parents come up to us afterwards, and they say, you know, we, we tried our best with little Johnny or with little Susie, and they went off to university. Now they don't want to come to church anymore. They're not interested. They're, they've, 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 they're toying with atheism, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. and, and just how powerful those evidences are. Yeah. Because, you know, getting back to the whole topic of the show today, Okay, if, if, if atheists can always explain their, their, the evidence according to their worldview, then what's the purpose of apologetics? Well, the fact is some people harden their hearts. The Bible's very clear about that, right? Yes. You, yes. you, you read the book of Romans, it's very uh, chilling in a sense that God says that some people, even though they knew God at one point, the evidence for him was clear, yeah. uh, plain to one. see by everybody. There's no excuse for anyone not to believe in, a cre in, in the Creator God, which, by the way, isn't enough for salvation. Right, that it's enough only to condemn comes, you. It's enough to condemn you. You know there's a God that you're responsible <coughs> to, but That's uh, right. not enough to save you. But some people just keep forcing the knowledge of God away from them to the point yeah. where they can actually confess and say, I don't believe there's a God. Yeah. Right? And so the evidences are important because some people, their heart, they don't harden their heart, and God uses these evidences um, and... and in examples like David here. Exactly. Just a wonderful example. I loved one of the th comments he said, uh, from him, I found out about Creation Magazine. He's talking about the testimony of a fellow he'd seen. He, he found out about Creation Magazine and started to receive my own copies. And this is his own words. Initially, I was really ticked off <laughs> with what I was reading. Not because it was bad, but because it was good. Why hadn't I been taught anything about this evidence for creation over the last 30 years of church attendance? He's yeah. like, well... Where's this, where's this gem been? <laughs> and we've heard that before. Exactly. <laughs> There's other testimonies as well. People are, uh, uh, yeah, I remember someone years ago coming up to me, a yeah, young person, uh, coming up to me angry. Right. Says, Why haven't I been taught this before? I, th I, thought, I thought, oh, here you we go. You thought he was mad at you. you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, you know, he was steaming. Mm -hmm. Why haven't I been taught this before? He, he, he was upset at, at his church leaders yeah, right. and, and other teachers in his life. You know, the, the guy's a Christian, but I've never heard this before. And uh, that's, that's what we want to do at Creation, uh, Creation Ministries, is get this information out there as much as possible. Go to creation.com.